Cuando se creó la Universidad Francisco Marroquín, nunca fue concebida como una institución educativa en sí, sino como un ideal, como una causa y como un poderoso agente de transformación. Esta es la diferencia entre la UFM y cualquier otra. La academia es el vehículo, claro, pero no el destino de lo que hacemos. Desde su primer día de vida hasta este preciso momento, la Universidad Francisco Marroquín ha existido para encontrar y nutrir mentes brillantes y para plantar en ellas la urgencia de preguntar, argumentar, transformar y elevar la realidad que les rodea. Nos urge la obligación de cuestionar los dogmas, sean del tipo que fueren. Nos rebelamos contra las tradiciones. Vivimos para crear nuestro propio destino, no para seguir mecánicamente reglas impuestas por otros. Existimos para forjar nuestros propios pensamientos, no para creer a ciegas en los hallazgos de terceros, por sublimes que parezcan. Creemos en el individuo, único con capacidad de pensar, razonar y actuar. ¿Por qué? ¿Cómo? ¿Qué pasaría si...? Este es el inicio más frecuente de las conversaciones en nuestras aulas. Creemos que no hay herramienta más poderosa que las preguntas, ni fuerza capaz de doblegar las ideas. Por eso no nos interesan las respuestas prefabricadas. Para nosotros no hay verdades absolutas. Creemos en la libertad como en nuestra brújula y en la responsabilidad como en nuestro norte. Nos inspiran los ideales y acciones de pensadores, maestros y fundadores. Individuos que han transformado la historia. Nos consume buscar, encontrar y acompañar a jóvenes mentes en su búsqueda personal y dotarlas de las herramientas para que al cambiar su destino, alteren la historia y empujen adelante a su comunidad, a su país y a su planeta. Estas no son simples palabras. Llevamos 50 años actuando. ¿Tienes alguna pregunta? As a former internet entrepreneur and Wall Street analyst and co-author of the Reagan Vision and contributor, contributor to Freedom Champions, please help me give him a warm welcome. Well, Robert, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I feel very privileged to be part of this celebration, you know, 50 years after uh, the impossible dream of UFM began to come to fruition and I'm so proud of how this institution has evolved and the role that it plays. And it's in that context that I, uh, you know, I was very happy for this opportunity to share a couple of thoughts about 
uh, freedom and higher education. And I thought I should maybe ground this in a little bit of my own personal experience because in my undergraduate days, which goes back some decades now, I was privileged to be at uh, one of the real elite institutions yeah, in the United States and enjoyed my time there, uh, came away with lifelong friends and um, uh, certainly felt like I had uh, enjoyed the, the college experience of living apart from home and everything. But um, sometime in my mid-20s, as I kind of embarked on uh, what at the end of the day I'd say was a much more rigorous self-study and ideas that I cared about, I came to appreciate that I had been cheated that I really didn't learn to be a critical thinker during those four years at college, that I had not been exposed to a body of classical liberal thought that I think has some of the most compelling answers to the fundamental question we should all be wrestling with, which is you know, how is it that human societies can flourish? So over the years, you know, I, I know that lots of my peers from, from college never had these regrets. They were very happy to have a, a credential. They had been happy to enjoy some fun times on campus. But um, at, at other schools, I know that people uh, receive much less and sometimes walk away more confused than when they enter. So as I began to think about the state of higher ed, especially in the US, I began to become quite cynical. Uh, I remember nodding along with a book that Glenn Reynolds wrote some 15 years ago called The, the Higher Education Bubble. And I began to look forward to what I still think is um, an almost inevitable implosion that's waiting to happen, the, an implosion to the idea that all ambitious young people need to go through this rite of passage that is higher ed. Um, I'm sort of cheering it on, but, um, uh, but something happened to me when I first became exposed to UFM. Um, I confronted here in these halls something very close to what I would consider the ideal of what a liberal education should be about. And this doesn't make me any less opposed to the disservice that so many uh, young people are receiving at institutions of higher education in the US and beyond, but I'm so thankful that we have UFM to give me um, a concrete example of what I think we should be aspiring to as an alternative to what exists in so many other places. And this kind of relates to an idea that at Atlas Network we've taken to heart uh, recently, to working with a lot of our partners on the topic of poverty. In, um, in, in sociological circles, they use the term a positive deviance. Um, this is the idea that if you care about poverty, perhaps it's better, instead of taking this sort of traditional view of looking at a low-income community finding the most typical um, uh, members of that community and then imagining how you might uh, help those people improve their situation, why not take a look at the same sample of people, but look at the positive outliers, these, these you know, positive deviants, and that they deviate from the, from the mean um, in, in ways that are very you know, uh, positive on different social indicators where you'd want to see progress. So you know, look at the people that have found a path out of poverty against all the obstacles and start to study how do we make that reality more accessible for others? How do we get those barriers out of the way? When I think about what UFM means, not just to Guatemala, uh, but to the world, we have here a, a positive deviant from which we can learn in the area of higher ed. So you know, when I think about my great wish, as you all are celebrating this 50th anniversary, I think about what it would be like when we come back in another five decades, when UFM is celebrating its 100th anniversary. I know that, uh, that there's so much innovation that happens here year to year. Uh, I'm sure there will be things that look vastly different here at Universidad Francisco Marroquin, but I hope that on its 100th birthday in 2071, that in its essence, I hope that UFM is the same. I hope that it is less unique than it is today because more of the world should have adopted these lessons from the amazing experiment that's been taking place here in Guatemala. Um, I also wanna uh, share with you one idea about why I think it's particularly critical that UFM stay this course. 
Um, I, I recently uh, published a book that Robert mentioned called uh, Liberalism and the Free Society in 2021. And it explores this idea as we continue to wrestle with the pandemic and as we fret about what the new normal looks like. You know, the, the, the fundamental question here is, you know, is the sun rising or is it setting on the free society? And I, um, uh, I take a pretty sober look at uh, the challenges that the free society faces these days. But I, I wound up optimistic for several reasons, but, but one of them is that the, um, the ideological extremes that exist, certainly in the United States, I think also in Latin America and Europe and beyond, um, have been moving uh, further and further to, to, to extremes that open up some opportunities for those of us who identify with the freedom movement. Uh, we no longer need to, as you know, part of um, our efforts to attract more individuals into our, into our crowd, we don't need to sell them on um, some narrow Rothbardian anarcho-capitalism. We don't need to start the conversations there. Um, the fundamental challenge these days, as I see it, is to um, exhibit the, the, the virtues of an authentic liberalism that, that um, believes in pluralism, that understands we can uh, disagree, but we can do that uh, through civil discourse. This has um, somehow been lost. This, this worldview of, um, uh, of classical liberalism, which is sort of the, the foundation of civilization as I see it, has somehow been, um, been, been seeded by the progressive left and by um, parts of the, the populist right. And I'm very optimistic that the community that Atlas Network nurtures and that UFM engages with in so many different ways, um, this community can be very influential in um, if we were able to stay true to our principles and get better on the messaging, um, get better in emphasizing the inclusivity of the liberal vision um, to show that we authentically value the, the, the dignity of every single person and that we want to solve problems in, in practical ways and that we're not here simply to, to, to win new converts to you know, fan clubs named after our favorite thinkers. And I think that if we can do that, we can create more of a, a common sense middle to political conversations that are happening in our different countries. And, and I have no illusions that this is going to translate quickly to, um, to libertarian policy victories, but I do think that we have a big opportunity to make mainstream some of the insights that many of you at UFM, many of us um, that uh, work in the, the freedom movement as a part of our careers, that we've gleaned from the works of Mises and Hayek and Friedman and so on. So that, that's um, sort of how I see that the big picture of what we're all striving for. And I, I hope that some of these thoughts just um, make uh, stakeholders of, of UFM more resolute in how important it is to stay true to the founding intent of Manuel Ayao and his uh, other founders of, of this university, the commitment to freedom, the um, wonderfully unique governance structure, the, the culture of civility and humility that I, I find here and, and the, the incredible just joy in seeing young people discover that they can ask new questions and answer in their own terms the really fundamental questions of human existence that we all should be grappling with. So I, I think that is exceedingly rare in most institutions of higher education. And I'm just uh, very grateful that these virtues exist here in abundance at UFM. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brad. We continue with Lawson Bader. He's president and CEO of Donors Trust, a donor advised fund that serves libertarian and conservative philanthropists. Board member of State Policy Network. He's former president of Competitive Enterprise Institute, former executive vice president of Mercatus Center, board member of Atlas Network and president of Antigua Forum 2019. Please help me give Lawson a very warm welcome.
Well, good afternoon, uh, and thank you. It's nice to be here. You know, there are many of us, and the day is long, so I'm just going to get to the point uh, for the sake of time. You know, UFM is uh, vital to ensuring the classical liberal movement keeps both its head and its heart, uh, and we need both. We need both because we want a future that aligns with our principles, of course, but we also want freedom for the majority of people, even if they don't always understand that to be the case. And to accomplish this, we need to recognize that we've got challenges, we've got opportunities, and let me just highlight two of them. First is one challenge, and it's significant. Uh, faith in institutions, government, educational, corporate, religious, scientific, it's at an all-time low. You know, one tenet of liberal orthodoxy is the importance of institutions, uh, public and private. <clears throat> We may debate the amount of power that they should or shouldn't have, but even the most ardent anarcho-capitalist knows we need such structures. That's how we maintain, change, and adapt rules of the game. They're the mechanisms by which we propose and challenge societal norms, and they rely on trust uh, to form the basis for voluntary exchange. Now, according to a recent survey by Heart and Mind Strategies in the US, fewer than one in three Americans express any real trust in these institutions. And 60% say we're failing to build confidence in public institutions. They distrust the media. They're frustrated <clears throat> with education, banking, healthcare, criminal justice system. And even before the pandemic, the University of Chicago uh, General Social Survey found globally that 30% of those surveyed agreed that most people cannot be trusted. I mean, 30% only believe that, which is the lowest in about 30 years of taking the survey. And once we talk about millennials, <clears throat> and I'll mention some more, and I know Thor will be talking about them as well, that number drops really to more like uh, 10%. Um, and most people, they believe, would take advantage of you if given the chance to do so. In the early 1980s, a Harvard professor named Sam Huntington predicted that a moment of serious mistrust uh, in the United States and globally would occur around the second or the third decade of the 21st century. Guess what? That's where we are. Um, in the US, this moment of serious institutional crisis sort of began around 2008, 2010. We had a lot of outsider groups push conservatives to the right, began to divide libertarians. We had young socialists uh, sort of upend the Clinton political machine, brought us Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. We had activist students on campus, which began redefining the notion of academic freedom and expression. The Black Lives Matter organization and its anti-economic freedom message had actually shrunk in size and impact only to re-emerge internationally in the last 24 months. And social media has destroyed any concept uh, or has sort of eliminated the idea of the fourth estate, a uh, sort of independent media sector. And of course, most recently, uh, as seen as suspect, the US electoral system of government. And in the middle of all this, in case things can't get that bad, like a hurricane arriving in the middle of a major earthquake, COVID-19 shows up and exposed all those societal flaws and drove wedges among families and neighbors and clients and customers and students and professors and shop owners and landlords and colleagues and friends. And it really led us to question whether any of this makes sense. Um, my friend David Brooks, who's not exactly a libertarian, um, describes social trust as the measure of a society's moral quality whether people and institutions in it are trustworthy, whether they keep their promises, whether they work for some notion of the common good, whether they self-police, whether they remain a positive force for individuals to pursue his or her dreams. When people in a church lose their faith in God, the church collapses. When people in society lose faith or trust in these institutions and in each other, nations collapse and vacuums notoriously undermine liberty. Today's emerging generations have little sense of security. The financial systems have gone up and down and have collapsed numerous times. Fragile families, failed institutions, children now expect to have a lower quality of life than their parents did. They're taught fear that dangerous people lurk outside every intersection, that they could get hurt playing outside, that they might get sick if they touch somebody, that they face apoplectic, apop, apop, I can never say that word, apop, apocalyptic climate destruction. So you get, it even gets me upset. Um, and they've learned that social media is vicious. Uh, their worldview is predicated on what? Threat, not safety. 
And thus the values of this dominant generation in the years ahead are exactly opposite those that we want in a liberal society, right? It's not liberation, it's security. It's not freedom, it's equality. It's not individualism, but the safety of the collective. You sink, it's not a sink or swim meritocracy, but the promotion on the basis of social justice. And once a generation forms its general viewpoint during young adulthood, it keeps it in that mentality and takes it to the grave 60 years later. And so we've entered what David describes as the age of precarity. Now, my hopefully second better observation is maybe a little better, that the development and the promulgation of classical liberal ideas is really no longer the purview of the university. Now, there are exceptions to this, and I'm sure some of you are in the room right now, so lighten up, don't worry, I'm not criticizing everybody. But the truth is that those departments and those faculty are spread among thousands of schools. Today's younger classical liberals are inclined to believe what they believe, uh, not because of their experience in the academy, unless it was a reaction to something particularly offensive, but because of their involvement in this larger ecosystem of liberty, which tend to be the independent, not-for-profit, some for-profit research groups. When I interview potential employees, or if I engage in younger people at events, I find they believe what they do because they've engaged with the Institute for Humane Studies, the Mercatus Center, FEE. Maybe they've taken that professional development class or a summer program with the Bill of Rights Institute or America's Future or Cato Sphere Project or the Acton Institute or the Koch Associates Program or the training programs of the State Policy Network and the Atlas Network. And if they haven't engaged directly in those groups, then they've developed their philosophy because of film and media efforts. Free the People, Reason TV, Learn Liberty, and then some of the for-profit groups like Emergent Order and Cortula Productions or Iron Light Labs. You know, there are over 500 sort of free market groups that engage in the application of the ideas of liberty globally. You know, and that number has doubled in the last 10 or 15 years. And what's more important is how these groups operate. They focus on educational and grassroots outreach to lawmakers, political stakeholders, citizens. They conduct original research on policy issues. They have creative media and communication strategies to the general public, and they emphasize developing young minds. And all of, this, all of this is done outside of the ivory tower. And in many ways, they are the reason why we have any success at all applying ideas and influencing political culture, expanding freedom, and dealing with the fallout of all this distrust. So where does that leave us? What does it mean for UFM? especially as we celebrate not just the past 50 years of existence, but think more about the next 50 years of opportunity before us. The original sociologist Emile Durkheim once said, a nation can be maintained only if, between the state and the individual, there is interposed a whole series of secondary groups near enough to the individual to attract them strongly in their sphere of action and drag them into the general torrents of social life. Occupational groups are suited for this role, and that is their destiny. As far as I'm concerned, UFM is one of those occupational groups. Brad's talked a little bit about UFM's key virtues, right? Humility, civility, an authentic search for truth. And I'd add another one. It's to produce not merely thinkers, but doers. I'm less interested in creating the next Milton Friedman than I am about producing armies of filmmakers and architects and engineers and dentists who value basic ideas of liberty and look not to government, but to their own abilities and voluntary associations to address problems. There is necessary value in showing that the ideas of liberty apply to all vocations. The idea of comparative advantage and trade-offs and voluntary exchange is not solely the domain of the economist. So first of all, we need to develop more alliances with this out ecosystem of liberty inside and outside of the United States. They need you as trans a transparently honest university without the pursuit of many of the liberal ideas and baggage that comes to so many US-based colleges. And you need their students, practitioners, and networks. You need them to be places where you can send your homegrown students, which is your most treasured asset. And you really need their donors, but that's a different conversation. Secondly, we need to improve the language of liberty. You know, we love talking about liberty, right? We devote more energy to proving how objectivist we are or not, and there are only about 14 objectivists in the entire world, for the record. And the reality is that the majority of the world doesn't care. Sorry if you're an objectivist, right? 
In other words, we fall short of focusing on the most important thing, which is the real impact of our ideas on individual human lives. So while I do remain pessimistic about the decay of societal trust, I do recognize that the preferences of today's young professionals are clear. They want jobs that contribute to making the world a better place. They want to support companies that embrace what they see as important. They seek to align their life choices with what they have determined to be, as Larry Arn says, the true, the good, and the beautiful. Well, UFM can be a messenger of this. We need to teach the heart alongside the mind. We need to couch value and freedom and opportunity very differently. Adam Smith has already taught us that material success is already a means to an end. So the question we all need to ask ourselves is to what end? As classical liberals, we care about improving human flourishing and giving each of us this freedom to prosper. But freedom and prosperity mean different things. For some, it's the freedom to choose a hobby, to pursue a skill. For others, it's making money through investing savings and starting a business. You know, some pursue wealth to stockpile villas and private airplanes. Some start charities to fight sex trafficking, raise living standards, cure malaria, etc. Along the way, one creates jobs for thousands and another soothes shattered souls. The great thing is that we who defend economic liberty view these intertwined endeavors with a very non-judgmental eye. We recognize them as the choices free individuals make to realize their dreams. We do it not just because we respect choices, but because we do understand that vast piles of money can constrict the heart or they can set it free. And so you need to promote the idea of the freedom to prosper, which for this generation is about promoting a future with sunset walks with loved ones rather than holding down two or three jobs to pay rent. It's living longer lives, it's living unafraid of major disasters. I got an apocalyptic thing that I couldn't say earlier, right? It's living in cleaner air and water. It's having multiple educational opportunities for children. It's adequate food stocks. Liberty produces value, not merely riches. And in today's world, we need citizens to understand that we do not always need to plant more grass to get the lawn to grow. We just need to remove the rocks that already cover it. And to rebuild trust among people and institutions, we also must be trustworthy. To convey the ideas of a classical liberal society, we must be transparent about addressing the heart first. We read Hayek not just because we believe the argument is intellectually interesting or correct, but because at the end of the day, it actually aligns with human behavior. So the idea of marginal utility and regulatory capture and a prisoner's dilemma are all important and necessary concepts, but why they are important is wasted on so many young adults today. We need them to understand that you can still trust somebody you do not like. They need to be confident in their own abilities and to value the voluntary, not the coerced collective. That risk-taking is good. That you if you should fail, there are non-governmental organizations and social networks that exist to ease you down. That is important to have a healthy skepticism of those who govern from authority and power, as well as those who push from the lofty perch of a corporation. Sometimes we need to take the bigger perspective. On one hand, it reminds us why we do what we do. You know, on the other hand, it might actually change the world. Thanks. <clears throat>
to discuss the history and prospects for education in a free society? Why has an academic enterprise founded at the height of the Cold War amidst violent internal conflict risen from this ravine as one of the premier liberal institutions in the world? How across the same five decades that have seen American universities succumb to ideological and institutional decay has UFM built and maintained a world-class academic program where students and faculty alike are continually reconnecting their studies with the core philosophical foundations of a free society. I believe that these are not accidental events, but are in fact the results that have emerged from the DNA of UFM, the genomic structure, so to speak, in which a deliberately chosen institutional architecture and a carefully cultivated organizational culture have entwined in a strong and stable arrangement that has thus far been resistant to epistemic, constitutional, or cultural drift. I want to call attention to the juxtaposition of the concepts of drift and choice. Drift is that state of affairs in which many of us pass our days, carried along by the prevailing winds of our culture, often trimming our sails to encounter the least resistance without being quite sure where those winds are taking us. Institutional drift is a similar phenomenon that takes place when whole organizations are either without an orienting compass point or are rudderless, lacking leaders who can steer through rough seas and keep an institution true to its orienting mission. Choice, on the other hand, is the inescapable business of a life lived in freedom and responsibility. In his book on the meaning of democracy and the vulnerability of democracies, the American political scientist Vincent Ostrom noted the importance of choice in human affairs. The phenomenon of choice, wrote Ostrom, of being able to consider alternative possibilities and to select a course of action is a universal feature of the human condition. Choice is a basic aspect of all adaptive arrangements. For Ostrom, choice entails having principles of selection and these principles by which we evaluate the options available to us and choose among them need to be raised to consciousness, made explicit, if we are to understand patterns of order in human societies and act freely and responsibly and make good choices in them. Social orders, Ostrom tells us, are the patterns that derive from the processes of selection and choice. And these processes, he notes, are necessary because human beings have to learn to adapt to our dual nature as animals, compelled by physical and emotional needs, and as artifactual beings, beings who live in history, who transcend the state of nature, who forge civilizations. Living in society necessitates moral judgment about how we will live, and such judgments rest upon our fundamental beliefs about whether we wish to be governed by principle or governed by discretionary authority. But who is this we that makes such choices and how are the beliefs and values that shape our choices formed in each of us and in we as a community? In other words, how do we learn to be civilized? How do we learn to govern ourselves in order to achieve the opportunities that become available through peaceful coexistence? Such are the questions that the founders of UFM contemplated in choosing to establish a university in Guatemala 50 years ago, a place of inquiry, dedicated to the mission of spreading the ethical, legal, and economic principles of a society of free and responsible people. The founding of UFM was not an act of asocial libertarian individualists, but was grounded in the recognition, as Manuel Ayal wrote, that freedom is a social concept. To a person alone on an island, in the absence of others, conflicting claims and the threat of force, Ayal asserted, freedom has no meaning. The governing statutes of UFM include among the purposes of the university decidedly social needs to cooperate in the diffusion and enrichment of culture as a universal heritage, to contribute to the formation of educated citizens capable of serving the community in teaching, research, professional practice, and the diffusion of culture, to educate in the sense of forming persons capable of directing their own destiny and of contributing to the direction of the destiny of their community. UFM, as we see it today, is thus the product of choices made by its founders and by each generation of leaders who have succeeded them. To understand the source of UFM's institutional stability is to understand the questions, the philosophical principles, the prudential judgments, and the passing on of traditions that have given rise to this carefully cultivated place of learning. The transmission of the UFM code, 
its genomic replication, so to speak, to each generation of students, teachers, deans, trustees, and directors is accomplished in many ways. The inscriptions you see all around campus remind us that to be at UFM is to partake in a long intellectual tradition. The core curriculum all students must undertake through the Henry Hazlitt Center ensures that each generation studies those ethical, legal, and economic principles that are essential to making choices that make us free. The new CoLab and Liberty in Action program culminates the student experience at UFM with an interdisciplinary learning experience where students apply the principles of freedom to social challenges. UFM's resistance to drift rests in a series of choices made by men and women who have become part of a living community that requires each student, each department, and the university's administration and governing officials to reflect upon the choice between drifting and living free as responsible persons. The choices made day by day and year by year by members of the UFM community have been given boundaries by UFM's governing statutes, by its philosophy statement, and by the ideas embodied in these constitutional documents. But they also emerge from what we might call the virtues of UFM. These virtues are more than merely values. They are ways of being that embody the seriousness of purpose of UFM's founders. UFM's virtues, I believe, reflect especially the character of its founding president, Manuel Ayal, but they became much more than the personal qualities of one man. They are the shared cultural and spiritual endowment that animates the body and enlivens the heart of UFM. I will enumerate these in, as four virtues, and I'll address them very briefly in turn. Intellectual, convic intellectual conviction, constitutional wisdom, moral courage, and humble charm. In his inaugural address in 1972, Manuel Ayo reflected on the relationship between the institutions and the ideologies of those who direct them. This belief that our ideas give shape to the character of our institutions, that ideas are truly consequential, is a cornerstone of UFM's cultural values. UFM was founded to embody, refine, and transmit certain convictions that its founders had, not merely about the need for and nature of academic excellence, but also about the philosophy of social order and the type of professional training conducive to the peaceful progress of civilizations. I'm quoting there from um, Musso's inaugural address as president. In the 20th century, universities around the world have become vectors of transmission more for socialism than for liberalism. The founders of UFM deliberately sought to create an institution that would re-enlist the arts and sciences in exploring the truth that people and societies will flourish best in conditions of liberty. But why choose a university? And how did the founders of UFM come to hold their belief that ideas would be the key to positive social development in Guatemala and beyond? For over a decade before the founding of UFM, these young entrepreneurs and professionals gathered in their spare time to study and read and discuss ideas. They obtained reading materials from the Foundation for Economic Education and the Institute for Humane Studies. They attended academic gatherings of the International Mount Pelerin Society and the US-based Philadelphia Society and the Liberty Fund. Organizing themselves as a small think tank, the Center for Economic and Social Studies, they forged a hard core with intellectual conviction of the truth of the freedom philosophy. The importance of this growing intellectual conviction cannot be overstated. UFM, more than perhaps any other classical liberal institution created in the late 20th century, embodies Albert Schweitzer's observation that civilization can only revive when there shall come into being in a number of individuals a new tone of mind, independent of the one prevalent among the crowd and sometimes in opposition to it. A tone of mind which will gradually win influence over the collective one and in the end determine its character. To oppose the crowd in such a way requires the second virtue I want to speak about, which is the virtue of moral courage. The original philosophy statement of UFM stated that our institution is coming to life in a world of conflict. Some may observe that this is always true of the human condition, but in the 1970s, Guatemala was torn by violent civil war and with most of, with most of Latin America was one of the battlefronts of the Cold War. Kidnappings, death threats, and murder were real possibilities in this world. It was, not, it was from necessity, not theatrics, that Musso donned a bulletproof vest to address the UFM community. What is the role of an institution of higher learning coming to life in such a world? UFM's founders believed that their purpose was neither to pacify the groups in conflict nor to join them. 
but was to place themselves beyond the conflicts of their time so that science and academic freedom might be preserved. The role of UFM scholars would be to watch, to think about, and to critically study present conditions in an effort to discover the probable shape of the future. It would be to strengthen the voice of reason when it seemed to face a universal crisis. The very fact of violence reveals a failure of reason and deepens the necessity for education. To resist the politicization of higher education in a world where schools themselves were targeted, targeted as sites for political capture required clarity of conviction and moral courage. It also brought forth the opportunity for the exercise of a third virtue, that of constitutional wisdom. UFM is an institutional order born of a set of questions about human nature and the world. Why is Guatemala poor? Why do the idols of socialism hold such sway over the human mind and heart? Why does political disagreement erupt into the triumph of power over persuasion? UFM would be an institution that would address these and other questions by partaking in the rich stream of inquiry in the classical liberal tradition. Where the theme is freedom, and it is given serious study and application in human institutions, people tend to flourish and reap the fruits of social cooperation and peaceful exchange. A liberal institution like a liberal society, however, is not easily attained or secured. While we believe that under the operation of natural laws, such orders can emerge, life rarely presents conditions free from the darker expressions of human nature. Liberal institutions continually require the elevation of reason and choice over accident and force. They must most often emerge then at what we can call constitutional moments. Constitutional moments are historical events that take place in time and space when a group of people come together with a shared purpose and set forth a set of rules that will govern the actions they will allow themselves to take in pursuit of their purposes. We look with admiration at many of the constitutional moments in the story of the advance of liberty. We read today the constitutional artifacts of those times, the Magna Carta, the Mayflower Compact, the U.S. Constitution, debatably the Spanish Constitution of 1812. Many of our libertarian friends speak of anarchy, and I think I'm the third person to say something about our, our anarchist friends, so maybe there's a question here for us today. Uh, they speak of anarchy, a world without government, as an ideal condition in which people would interact freely under the natural laws of property, contract, and exchange, but it is rare that human beings can consistently constrain themselves by natural laws. In the absence of universal self-governance, rules of right action and proper restraints on power are necessary. These, are, these restraints are needed when, wherever we gather and combine our lives, liberties, and properties to pursue purposes in common. We often neglect, when we study the sciences of governance, to reflect upon the constitutions that govern our smaller voluntary institutions the charters of corporations, the bylaws of voluntary associations, the donor intent set forth in wills and trusts. This study of voluntary governance, the ways in which we constrain ourselves through agreed upon rules, is a field of study I have been working to promote through my own scholarship. And I believe the future of liberalism necessitates that we understand better the ways in which we constitute order that restrains rather than enshrines power. Over the last year, Gabriel Calzada has engaged many people within the UFM community and beyond in reading the founding documents of this university. And I encourage you to ask him to share that set of documents, including the fundamental statutes of the university. They're on paper, you can read them. In understanding these documents, you will discover that a sound constitution is part of your patrimony from UFM's founders. What makes the constitution itself stable, however, are the addition of the other virtues the intellectual conviction that it rests in true principles, and the moral courage to live by its wisdom. This does not mean that we do not improve and change the letter of the law when circumstances make that necessary, but it does mean that such changes are undertaken with sobriety and prudence and are guided by principle. It is noteworthy that in the 50 years since the founding of UFM, its statutes have been modified only six times. Finally, I would like to address the virtue of what I will call humble charm. There are questions about how well UFM shares its learning and its belief in liberty with the people of Guatemala and with the world. I have heard more than once in my short time in Guatemala questions about whether UFM is truly for all the people of Guatemala or whether it is only for the rich and the elite. 
My opinion is that UFM has been from the beginning for all Guatemalans and for all peoples of the world. And that to the, the, to the extent that we resist institutional drift and continue to understand and renew the virtues that make UFM unique, it will continue to be a significant force in helping the ideals of liberty prevail here in Guatemala, in the Americas, and around the world. To speak of historical force, though, asks us to understand the nature of change in history. The founders of UFM had the conviction that certain ideological positions, like socialism and liberalism, are mutually exclusive. They also had the moral courage to stand in the less popular camp and the constitutional wisdom to create an institution that could stand the challenges of its time and place. Nevertheless, they also exhibited a humility and charm that has not diminished their sense of fellowship with their countrymen or with peoples around the world. Musso recognized and taught us all in his unique way one of the hardest lessons, that people who defend socialism and ideas with which we don't agree are often men and women of goodwill. To engage in discussion with an intellectual opponent, one must start with humility. No one has a monopoly on truth, Musso wrote. Differences of opinion with people of goodwill are not cause for enmity, but for conversation. Where differences arise from sincere disagreement over complex ideas, we need reason to adjudicate, but first we need to be invitational, to exercise hospitality and to know our own arguments and be able to express them persuasively. There's a saying in English that you can catch more flies with honey than with vinegar, and this virtue of bearing ourselves among our enemies with humble charm is indispensable. Can UFM stand another 50 years without institutional drift? Can we learn to better embody these virtues of intellectual conviction, moral courage, constitutional wisdom, and humble charm? I believe it is possible, and I believe it is imperative. In concluding, I would like to reflect again on the unique geography of UFM. For so many classical liberals and libertarians who visit UFM from other countries, the comparison of UFM to Galt's Gulch of Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrug novel are inevitable. But I have a different view of this beautiful ravine. UFM is not a place where the remnant of civilization can come to live out some liberal utopia. UFM is not a place for the remnant, but it is instead a sending institution for the future. The founders did not design UFM to be an ivory tower separated from the world, but to under undertake the investigation, study, and teaching that would in fact help us make the world better, more prosperous, and more free. UFM is deeply embedded in a particular society and a particular culture. Its presence in Guatemala has an impact in this time and place. But the work of UFM and its faculty and graduates also reaches far beyond this country. The alumni of UFM are working and living around the world at the top of their professions. And visitors to UFM seem always to return home and recruit one or two more friends to come see and taste the fruits of this imp seemingly impossible dream of a small group of people who looked around at their world and made a choice to dedicate their lives and fortunes to make it better. I am honored to have an opportunity to share in this dream and this journey, and I invite each of you here today and those of you online watching, I hope from all around the world, to think deeply about the importance of what we do here, to take pride in the broad ripple effect it is having in our world, and to renew your personal and professional commitment to ensuring that the ideas of UFM continue to have significance and positive consequences in Guatemala and far beyond. Animo. Thank you very much, Lenore, and once again, welcome to the team. We continue with Philip Magnus. Philip W. Magnus is a senior research fellow at the American Institute for Economic Research. He holds a PhD and an MPP from George Mason University School of Public Policy and a BA from the University of St. Thomas in Houston. Prior to joining IRE, Dr. Magnus spent over a decade teaching public policy, economics, and international trade at institutions including American University, George Mason University, and Berry College. Magnus' work encompasses the economic history of the United States and Atlantic world, with specializations in the economic dimensions of slavery and racial discrimination, the history of taxation, and measurements of economic inequality over time. 
He also maintains active research interest in higher education policy and the history of economic thought. In addition to his scholarship, Magnus's popular writings have appeared in numerous venues, including the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Newsweek, Politico, Reason, National Review, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. Please help me give him a very warm welcome. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk to you about a subject that uh, is very close to my heart and research interests, and that is the nature of education in a free society. But I'm going to do it from a perspective that analyzes the economics of higher education. Just under 250 years ago, a uh, philosopher by the name of Adam Smith wrote a very important book. We consider it important for all sorts of other reasons, but one of the lesser known uh, components of that book diagnosed the state of higher education in his day. And Smith had a very important observation. When you take markets out of education, bad things happen. He came to this observation by comparing his own institution in Scotland to a visitation he did at the University of Oxford, what was then considered one of the great universities of the world and still is today. When he got to Oxford, he noticed that the faculty were lazy. They uh, taught lectures that were decades out of date. The students did not attend class. The students were not interested in learning. And the administration of the university seemed more uh, interested in ensuring a continuous stream of salaries to itself and to its faculty than actually serving an educational mission. What was the difference that Smith noted? Students did not directly pay for their education at Oxford, but they did in Scotland. And when they did directly pay for their education, faculty responded through market mechanisms to improve their classes. In other words, students voted with their feet and dollars. They went to the popular professors, the professors that delivered. 250 years later, I would argue we are not only mired in these same problems in, in higher education, but they've also become entrenched with political and economic rent seeking associated with the fact that most of higher education has adopted a stance that its funding model should come from the public through taxpayer appropriations. We're standing in the middle of, of one of the very few institutions in the world today that rejects that model, but there's an interesting market lesson there. What I want to do is diagnose some of the problems that have emerged in higher education and give you a glimpse of the data of what is happening right now and how we can look at some of these trends. Higher education is in an intellectual crisis at the moment. It's in the midst of an ideological hegemony of an anti-market, anti-capitalistic left. Its latest fashionable idea, critical theory, sometimes referred to critical race theory being a derivative of it, not only rejects market capitalism and liberal institutions, considers itself avowedly opposed to market capitalism and liberal institutions, but it also rejects intellectual diversity. It rejects other perspectives, considers itself at war with those perspectives. Higher ed, by being a rent-seeking institution, has also directed vast amounts of resources into politicized degrees that do not deliver intellectual content, do not deliver knowledge, but rather seek to weaponize their subject matters to disrupt the world in a leftward direction. This is a direct principle that comes out of critical theory, the term itself, critical theory being derivative of Karl Marx's subtitle to Das Kapital, a critique of political economy. What is a critical theory? It is a theory that seeks not to describe, but to change, to alter, to, to disrupt for a specific ideological agenda. And that is growing on campus. But more important to that, the economic model of what's happening in higher education, and I can show you some data from the United States, all this is true of most areas where taxpayer dollars have invaded the higher ed space and become the dominant allocation mechanism of resources. Bloat is pervasive, and it's bloat of an administrative nature. It's functionaries of other offices that are not delivering educational content, but are delivering supposed services on campus, many of them of a political nature. This is the United States since the mid-1970s to today. And you can see the growth in the number of faculty and administrators. The faculty are at the very top in the orangish color. Administrators as executives are at the bottom in the blue. 
that is presidents and vice presidents, but the one area that's grown is this gray line. These are mid-level managerial administrators, bureaucrats that have taken over higher education. They are consumers of resources. If you want to understand why tuition is going up, why money is being dumped into the higher education vat with not much of a return, there's your answer. And this trend has continued unabated even through COVID when most campuses around the world were shut down. The people on the gray line were still paid to do or not to do their jobs from home. Faculty bloat in U.S. higher ed has been very disproportionate toward politicized disciplines. And I want to show you an example from two in particular. Economics, which actually works something of a market mechanism. The blue line here is the number of economics bachelor's degrees issued in a given year in the United States. Since about uh, the mid-1990s to the present day, you can see it's increasing. It's a popular discipline. People want to study economics because it has value in the real world. It's useful for getting a job. Number of faculty in economics has lagged behind. It has not grown as fast as the student demand for it. Why? There's an allocation question here. The other discipline I want to show you is English, arguably the most politicized department on campus, English literature, especially in the United States, and it's true of most literature programs around the world. You see the exact opposite trend. Students, again the blue line, are not really increasing. In fact, they've dipped a bit in recent years. Nobody wants to get an English degree because it's very hard to get employment with an English degree or a literature degree. But what has happened to the faculty ranks? They've grown and grown and grown. Massive amounts. Again, this being the most politicized discipline on campus. Even though higher education has adopted a funding model that repudiates market mechanisms, it cannot escape markets entirely. And this is the silver lining that we're seeing in the world. This is an opportunity as well to offer something different. This is a rank ordering of college degrees from the most popular, those that are growing in size. And you see at the very top, things like science, the STEM fields, business, economics, entrepreneurship, basically creative disciplines. What's going on down at the bottom? Anthropology, political science, history, religion, literature, the humanities in particular, the most politicized disciplines. They are declining in popularity. Students are voting with their feet. What do these departments at the bottom do? They nonetheless try to require students to take their classes. That was their way around uh, the problem that Adam Smith diagnosed. On top of this, we've seen a rapid and pronounced ideological shift in higher education that's taken place only within the last 15 to 20 years. I use the United States again as an example because it has some of the best data in the world, but most other universities and institutions have followed similar suit. The United States has data on the ideological positions, political beliefs of faculty going back to the 1960s. And what do we know from that? From about 1965 to roughly 19... 95, 2000, thereabouts, there's a relatively stable distribution of intellectual diversity on campus. The political left was a plurality. They hovered at around 45% of all faculty, but the remainder was divided between what were classified as the political right, that's conservatives, libertarians normally are classified in these surveys in that area, and then political centrists or moderates. Those are the other two lines. So the blue line, the political left, the orange and gray lines are conservatives, libertarians, centrists, moderates, everyone else. Something changed around the year 2000. The left started taking off in numbers. And it came at the expense of everyone else. The one that declined the most is the gray line. That is everyone to the right of center. That is where all free market traditions are. That is where all classical liberal traditions are classified. This is all, all right of center, conservative, libertarian, you name it. Declined so rapidly after about the year 2000 that it currently comprises only about 10% of all U.S. faculty that associate on the political right. The left 
hovers between 60 and 65 percent of all U.S. faculty. So we've seen a rapid politicization of the academy in only 15 to 20 years. Even scarier is this other chart. These are the percentage of college faculty that identify on the far left, the outright Marxists, the outright socialists, those that are espousing the destruction of a free society. For the better part of our survey data's existence from the 1960s to about the year 2000, they hovered at around 4 to 5%. Then they shot up. They're now around 12 to 13% of all university faculty in the United States. In other words, the Marxists outnumber all political traditions on the right combined. This is a crisis in higher ed that does not seem to be abating. In fact, the very opposite is occurring. A very opposite trend is, is occurring. They are growing. We're expecting the latest numbers to come out in the next year or so, and it will probably show a further increase in the leftward shift of the academy. It's also an unprecedented event for any point in, um, in recent history because even though the academy has tended to lean left of center as a whole, it was a stable medium. There was room for intellectual diversity. There was room for minority viewpoints to make arguments. That's being squeezed out at institutions across the world. But have faith in markets. Why should you have faith in markets? Because they actually do work. And uh, if we learn anything from central planning, uh, central planners cannot escape the very mechanisms that they're trying to manipulate, control, and organize from the top down. Market mechanisms are working in higher education in spite of itself. This chart took all of the different disciplines that I showed in that previous slide based on their popularity and put that on one axis. So down at the bottom, you have the number of majors, whether it's increasing or decreasing or staying stable over the past 10 years. And the important thing to focus on is this red dotted line in the middle. That's the break even point. Anything to the left of it is losing majors. Anything to the right is growing. And what do you notice? Economics, business management, math, physics, health sciences, computer sciences, engineering are all increasing in majors. What's declining? English, anthropology, history, classics, religion, foreign languages, philosophy, political science, and art. The most politicized disciplines. And that's what the vertical category shows. The higher you are on the vertical category, that's the more politicized and leftward leaning that discipline is as a whole. Students are voting with their feet. They are rejecting critical theory. They are rejecting Marxism. They are rejecting leftist ideology that yields them majors that have very uh, little value in the real world, in the marketplace. And they're running to majors, to disciplines that have productive value in society. The students know what's going on in higher education as much as the universities wish to uh, pretend otherwise. Where does this leave us? Well, it leaves us in a, uh, a very interesting situation because one thing we know about rent extraction, rent seeking when it occurs, and when public institutions and vast amounts of public money are captured by a political interest, which I would argue higher ed has done, it's very, very hard to break that away from the institution. It's like getting rid of an ethanol subsidy, only thousands of times worse with higher education because there are so many interests involved. So I want to fast forward a little bit in history from Adam Smith's time to another economist, James Buchanan, a Nobel Prize winner, who wrote a great little book, and I'm going to mention the term uh, anarchy, but in a very different context of our previous speakers. He wrote a book called Academia and Anarchy, and his diagnosis there was not of a uh, positive anarchy. Uh, he was referring to it as chaos. And one of the observations that Buchanan made in a postscript that he wrote to this book was that higher ed operates as a rent seeker. It operates as an institution of self-perpetuation above all. And it's an ideological institution, but it's more so interested in taking taxpayer monies and appropriating it to careers in activism, careers in ideology. This is 60 years ago he's making this observation. Higher education 
acts as though the taxpayer has some sort of sacred obligation to throw increasing amounts of revenues over the university's ivied walls without so much as the right to inquire what happens behind those walls. Sound familiar? Inspecting a handout. And most of the higher education institutional mechanisms in the United States and most other countries around the world have taken on this model. And you see protests from faculty and administrators whenever there is pushback on the very sound public finance basis of taxpayers asking what their money is being used to fund. We had an episode last week, the University of Wisconsin, a public institution, major research university in the United States, paid what is probably tens of thousands of dollars to move a 70-ton racist boulder on campus that was deemed offensive because someone had used a racial slur uh, to refer to it back in 1925. These are the types of appropriations that run rampant in higher education today. But what's the alternative? What's the model that Buchanan would ask us to consider? It's the same model Adam Smith proposed back in 1776 in The Wealth of Nations. And that is the model of market competition. I'm not turning to a continuous stream of income from the government to operate, but to actually serve what students want, to serve what faculty are interested in providing and doing so in a rigorous competitive intellectual environment. UFM's adopted the Adam Smith model. And seeing the tour of campus yesterday, my first time down here, hopefully the uh, not my last one that I want to repeat again. We saw a vibrant marketplace of ideas of education being offered. We saw classrooms, even classroom space, being allocated according to market mechanisms. We saw competition. We saw free and open discussion, a classroom style that's structured around conversation, not someone standing on a stage and lecturing doctrine at the students. These are all market mechanisms in play and market mechanisms around us. All it takes is one institution to break from the uh, traditional mold. All it takes is one institution to do something different uh, from the rest of higher education. UFM is doing that, and even though it's a very small institution, it's making an outsized impact in the world because it is showing that there is indeed another path. And that is what I see as our answer to the, uh, the quagmire of higher education that we found ourselves in. So thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. We continue with Thor Haberson. Thor is human rights advocate and film producer. He founded the New York-based Human Rights Foundation, and he's also the founder and CEO of the Oslo Freedom Forum, an annual global gathering described by The Economist as a spectacular human rights festival on its way to becoming a human rights equivalent of the Davos Economic Forum. Haverson also founded the Moving Picture Institute in 2005 and has produced several films that focus on freedom and award-winning documentaries about the Chinese, Soviet, Hungarian, and Estonian revolutions. Prior to his work at HRF and MPI, Halverson was the founding and was the founding CEO of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, FIRE, and served from 1999 until 2004. Thor has lectured at universities across the world on matters of liberty. He is a lifetime member of the National Association of Scholars, and he told me that he is the most proud of having the title of visiting professor at Universidad Francisco Marroquín. Please help me give him a very warm welcome. Good morning, everyone. My name is Thor Halverson. I'm president of the Human Rights Foundation, and it is for me a great honor to join you at Universidad Francisco Marroquín for their 50th anniversary. And a very special thanks to UFM for having me here today. Let me start off with a quote from around the year 20 BCE by the Roman poet Horace. Our parents, worse than our grandparents, gave birth to us who are worse than they are and we shall in our turn bear offspring still more evil than us. For thousands of years, 
Each generation has been skeptical about the competence and talent of the next generation. And seldom has the senior generation not prophesied the demise of civilized society due to the antics of the new generation. So my question for today is this. Is there really a problem in higher education or are baby boomers and millennials simply just misunderstanding Generation Z, as every generation before it has misunderstood the generation that followed? I think the data on this subject, which is being measured across college campuses in the United States and in other places around the world, like Canada, the UK, and Spain, suggests that what is happening with Generation C is rather different than with other generations. This has been studied at length by social psychologist and NYU professor Jonathan Haidt in his most recent book, The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure, which he co-wrote with my former colleague at FIRE, Greg Lukianoff. I am going to be drawing heavily on their findings. The numbers are telling. After remaining more or less flat in the 1970s and 80s, the rates of adolescent depression declined slightly from the early 90s through the mid 2000s. But since 2009, the percentage of teenagers from ages 12 to 17 who have reported to have at least one major episode of depression has increased, especially among young girls. Suicides by children from the age of 5 to 11 have almost doubled in recent years. Children emergency room visits for suicide attempts uh, or suicidal ideation rose from 580,000 in the year 2007 to 1.1 million in the year 2015. This increase is also present in adolescents aged 15 to 19. And since the year 2010, the percentage of college students who say that they have a psychological disorder has measurably increased. So what is the reason for this increase in depression, anxiety, and suicide rates? What is happening to Generation Z? And why are they so vulnerable? Why are they so fragile? And the suicide rates, why are they so self-harming? Perhaps more important and relevant to our conversation today, what are the ultimate consequences of this on campus life, including university culture, and the freedom to openly debate and discuss the merits of competing ideas? Research on this subject suggests several potential culprits. For instance, despite decades of evidence that helicopter parenting is seriously counterproductive, children today are perhaps more overprotected, warier of adulthood, and in need of more therapy than ever before. In his 2018 book, The Self-Driven Child, clinical neuropsychologist William Stixrud argues that today's parents deprive children of the meaningful control over their own lives, putting them at heightened risk of anxiety and depression. He explains that, quote, children don't need perfect parents, but they do benefit greatly from parents who can serve as a non-anxious presence. By depriving children from unsupervised play, for example, the shielding of children from every possible risk. Parents may be leading children to react with exaggerated fear in situations that aren't risky at all and isolating them from the adult skills that they will one day need to master. Therefore, parents should not try to protect their children from an increasingly overwhelming world. If we want to prepare children to withstand the thousand cuts of everyday life, such as the basic Socratic method in college, they should be allowed to encounter obstacles. A likely second culprit for abrupt shifts in the behavior of teenagers and their emotional well-being, which has direct implications on the current state of higher education, is the use of social media. According to San Diego State University professor Jean-Marie Twang, the arrival of the smartphone has radically changed every aspect of teenagers' lives, from the nature of the social interactions to their mental health. These changes have affected young people in every corner of America and in every type of household. The trends appear among teens from poor and rich backgrounds, teens of every ethnic background, 
and teens living in cities, suburbs, and small towns. Wherever there are cell towers, there are teens living their lives on their smartphones. These changes have taken on multiple forms. For instance, the number of teens who get together with their friends nearly every day dropped by more than 40% from 2000 to 2015, signaling that physical interaction has been replaced by virtual interaction. Teens on social media are more likely to be unhappy, and those who spend more time than average on non-screen activities are more likely to be happy. Generation Z, or as we may call them, the social media natives, are also different in how they go about sharing their moral judgments and supporting one another in moral campaigns and conflicts. Social media has fundamentally shifted the balance of power in relationships between students and faculty. Faculty now increasingly fear what students may do to their reputations and careers by stirring up online mobs against them in the event of a disagreement or a conflict, given that social media makes it extraordinarily easy to join crusades, to express solidarity, or to express outrage. Within this context, with more anxious, fragile, coddled, and easily mobilized Generation Z entering college around the year 2014, 2015, our conversation leads to the third likely culprit, driving the culture of safetyism we see today in higher education that is so incredibly toxic. College campus administrators and faculty members have welcomed and promoted the idea that students are at permanent risk of harm by ideas that they may find incompatible with their own or those that are not quote unquote mainstream. According to Haight, College administrators are enabling and promoting the same patterns of distorted thinking among students which psychological treatments like cognitive behavioral therapy try to alleviate. Among the several cognitive distortions, and all of these have medical definitions uh, and paragraphs, if not entire books on them, catastrophizing, overgeneralizing, dichotomous thinking, and emotional reasoning. For far too long, American universities have tolerated what can only be described as the rejection of open inquiry and debate. Indeed, many students have become anti-free speech activists on campus, shutting down and threatening opening, open inquiry. There have even been some instances in which demonstrators have gone as far as shooting fireworks at police, breaking windows, and starting fire in response to a particular campus speaker who may actually affect their very fragile minds with a phrase or two. Freedom of thought, expression, and inquiry are principles which institutions of higher learning must commit to upholding and must continue to defend. Any institution who fails to uphold these basic principles will categorically fail on its most fundamental goal, the search for the truth. In the United States, the bare minimum that institutions of higher education need to start doing in order to turn the tide on the culture of safetyism that has unfortunately become prevalent on college campuses is to join initiatives that address the current attacks on freedom of inquiry head on, such as the University of Chicago's Principles on Freedom of Expression, which are a statement of intent, committing the institution to upholding freedom of expression on university campuses. The principles highlight that, quote, fostering the ability of members of the university community to engage in such debate and deliberation in an effective and responsible manner is an essential part of the university's educational mission. Universities in the United States need to do what Gabriel Calzada was mentioning earlier today. They need to allow space for a real conversation. Chicago's university has expressed that an education that fosters free expression empowers students to engage with challenging ideas in college and throughout their lives. Further, there should be clear non-obstruction policies for protests, which should be implemented by colleges and universities. Members of the university community should, of course, be free to protest. However, it should not be in any way that would otherwise prevent other people 
from speaking out and expressing their own viewpoints, such as heckling or other disruptive or harmful actions to sabotage events. Finally, universities should include viewpoint diversity. It's a kind of diversity as protected on campus. It should be. This would simultaneously safeguard freedom of expression and the ultimate goal of institutions of higher education, which again is the search for truth. Colgate University implemented a task force on academic freedom and freedom of expression, similar to the one that was created um, in 2017 in Chicago. They represented a range of people and viewpoints, and they compromised students, faculty, staff, and the board of trustees. They reviewed the university's history of academic freedom and freedom of expression, and they drafted a statement similar to the Chicago principles. Members of the task force frequently held meetings with other members of the university community in order to discuss relevant issues. And they created a space that encouraged all voices to be heard. As they mentioned, quote, when considered separately, we have admirable goals. When these goals are viewed together, they aggregate to form a much loftier ambition to share knowledge and foster understanding within a rapidly changing and diverse world. These timeless pursuits are relevant to all universities that seek the truth and support robust deliberations that empower students to form ideas, exchange ideas, challenge ideas, and most important, to refrain from suppressing ideas. It is such a joy to be at a university that suffers from none of these issues that so terribly afflict higher education across the world and most especially in North America. How wonderful that here we can actually discuss in detail the profound importance of retaining freedom and how we may go about this task. Thank you very much. Cuando se creó la Universidad Francisco Marroquín, Nunca fue concebida como una institución educativa en sí, sino como un ideal, como una causa y como un poderoso agente de transformación. Esta es la diferencia entre la UFM y cualquier otra. La academia es el vehículo, claro, pero no el destino de lo que hacemos. Desde su primer día de vida hasta este preciso momento, la Universidad Francisco Marroquín ha existido para encontrar y nutrir mentes brillantes, y para plantar en ellas la urgencia de preguntar, argumentar, transformar y elevar la realidad que les rodea. Nos urge la obligación de cuestionar los dogmas, sean del tipo que fueren. Nos rebelamos contra las tradiciones. Vivimos para crear nuestro propio destino, no para seguir mecánicamente reglas impuestas por otros. Existimos para forjar nuestros propios pensamientos. No para creer a ciegas en los hallazgos de terceros, por sublimes que parezcan. Creemos en el individuo, único con capacidad de pensar, razonar y actuar. ¿Por qué? ¿Cómo? ¿Qué pasaría si? Este es el inicio más frecuente de las conversaciones en nuestras aulas. Creemos que no hay herramienta más poderosa que las preguntas, ni fuerza capaz de doblegar las ideas. Por eso no nos interesan las respuestas prefabricadas. Para nosotros no hay verdades absolutas. Creemos en la libertad como en nuestra brújula y en la responsabilidad como en nuestro norte. Nos inspiran los ideales y acciones de pensadores, maestros y fundadores. Individuos que han transformado la historia. Nos consume buscar, encontrar y acompañar a jóvenes mentes en su búsqueda personal y dotarlas de las herramientas para que al cambiar su destino, alteren la historia y empujen adelante a su comunidad, a su país y a su planeta. Estas no son simples palabras. Llevamos 50 años actuando. ¿Tienes alguna pregunta? <risa> 